Morning, this is Brian. Today is a glorious Sunday, January 31st, 2021. I am in the San Gabriel Mountains, just east of Monte Cristo Campground off Angeles Forest Highway. And today I want to present a spotlight on shrubs. Today I want to focus on a very common plant, especially in chaparral, coastal sage scrub, mountains, and even near the desert. This is called chaparral yucca, Hesperyl yucca whippley. It's a plant found mostly in central and southern California from the southern foot of the Sierras and I believe in the coast ranges down into Baja, California. Sometimes from right near the ocean to the edge of the high desert. Elevations ranging from near sea level to sometimes even over 8,000 feet. Where I am is about an elevation of 4,150 feet above sea level. And this is a very common place to find chaparral yucca. In open stands of chaparral, just like this. That's why we call it chaparral yucca. This plant used to be known as yucca whippley, meaning it was uh, deemed to be closely enough related to be closely enough related to the yuccas to be considered yucca. But after DNA analysis showed some differences, some differences like really deep analysis, they decided to give it its own genus, Hespero yucca. Now there are, I believe, three species of Hespero yucca. Um, one species I don't know the name of. I believe it's in Baja, but don't quote me on that. There's also this one, Hespero yucca whippley, and then we also have Hespero yucca newberry, the Grand Canyon or newberry yucca. So, like yuccas, this is in the agave family, agavaceae, and it forms a shrubby mass. This is actually a plant that has a lot of forms. So I'll go into that a little more later, but forms a very shrubby mass of extremely sharp tipped leaves. So people hiking in chaparral country will want to be careful while hiking around this plant because it will poke you and it hurts. I've been poked before, so it'll poke you right through jeans and it will draw blood. So the chaparral yucca is a monocot. Plants of the agave family are monocots, so there is one cotyledon per seed. So a plant will sprout with one cotyledon, like palms, like grasses, and I believe banana plant. I believe bananas are monocots. So like those, they sprout with one seedling leaf, as opposed to two, like plants like these, the chamise. Adenosoma fasciculatum variety fasciculatum, which is a eudicot. And eudicots sprout with two seedling leaves. So there's really very little in the way of kinship between chaparral yucca and any of these other, these other plants around here. So the chaparral yucca ranges from forming one rosette in some forms to forming multiple rosettes, as in this form here. This form is the uh, is known as the cespitose form. It might have been elevated to variety or subspecies level in the past, but I believe that is not uh, generally accepted by botanists, even though it does have a different form. You can see here, here's one rosette, and you come over here, there's another rosette, and you come over here, another rosette, and this has probably got like five to ten rosettes at least, maybe more. So there are some chaparral yuccas, especially the ones in Orange in San Diego County, I believe, that form one single rosette. And that's going to come into very important play for the life cycle of the chaparral yucca. Because the chaparral yucca very, the tip of the chaparral yucca is what will form the giant flower stalk. The huge flower stalk that in some individuals can reach well over 10 feet tall. If you look over here, you can see some examples. Here's a good example. Here's a chaparral yucca stalk right here 
probably from a couple of years ago. These are what the these are what the uh, this is what the seed capsules look like. There are these three chamber capsules, and they have these little flattened black discs of seeds. So there's one that's still erect, right up here. This is an erect chaparral yucca, and here I am moseying off the trail to get this. So you see, these flower stalks can get quite tall, but I've seen them ta much taller than this before on some forms. So the apical meristem, in other words, the tip of the growth of this plant will send up an extremely fast growing stalk that looks like a huge asparagus spear in the late winter and spring months, depending on elevation. Higher up you go, the later it's gonna happen. So by early spring at the low elevation to late spring at higher elevations, maybe even early summer, they set these up and you get these masses of beautiful white flowers, sometimes with some pinkish tinges on them. Then they develop into these seed capsules that split open and released the black seeds. Little flat disc black seeds which are very common in the agave family. So here I am trying to see if I can get to a seed capsule without either poking myself or sliding down the mountain on this very precarious slope. So these are the seed capsules, they split open. And what happens is the rosette dies because this is the this is the apical growth point. Like on palms, a lot of palms, species of palms, if you cut the uh, the apical meristem off, the palm's going to die after its lower leaves die off. The plant's going to die. So chaparral yucca is quite similar in that aspect. However, it's not as simple as it's, it's not as simple as it sounds. See what happens is the rosette that flowers and fruits is the rosette that's going to die. So that can mean many different things. For a chaparral yucca that only forms one rosette, like the typical whippley form, which is uh, found typically where I go hiking a lot in the Santa Ana Mountains, where there's only one rosette, the whole plant's going to die because it's at the end of its life cycle. However, the cespitose form, like this one, that forms offshoots around the base. In other words, they pup. They call them pups. And then they turn into these full-blown rosettes. So when, the rose, so when you have multiple rosettes, the plant will carry on the clone. These are all clones of the same plant from the same rootstock. So this rosette you can see here is all brown and dead because that rosette flowered. But since this one is a clone, the plant itself is still alive because it's got this rosette that hasn't flowered yet, that rosette which hasn't flowered yet, and a rosette over there that hasn't flowered yet. This one looks like a very good candidate to flower this year, possibly. I can't say for sure, but, maybe, but you know, you, as you see there, if you have multiple rosettes, your clone will carry on. You can sh sh uh, grow shoots from the base. However, ones that don't, I think this one was a single, I think this one was a single one. You see here, it dies, it breaks off, and there you have it. This one looks like it only had one rosette. I'd say a nice chunk of the ones out here tend to be the multiple rosette forms. Not all of them. This one right here is a relatively relatively young yucca. But you can see, it's got the main rosette here and sent out another rosette over here. And this is called the, that's called the, I believe, I believe it's called the cespitose form. I know you find that more towards the desert side of the San Gabriels and San Bernardinos. So this might be the cespitose form, as I was saying before. This one right here seems to be a single rosette. So it seems like the population here is quite variable. Because a lot of them have multiple rosettes. That one's multi-rosetted. 
The one I just showed you at the beginning of the video has multiple rosettes. This one does not seem to have a multiple rosette. So this one seems to be a singular form. So there can be quite a bit of variability within, within a population. So to be honest, I don't know if this really is a cespitose form. This one right here just seems to be the, the simple form. This one will probably not pop from the base. So likely this one will probably die after it sends up its flowering stock. This one will live to, uh, to, to uh, continue probably for several years. So chaparral yucca's habitats, I mentioned coastal sage grub, chaparral, and you can also see them on south-facing slopes in the yellow pine forest too. I've seen them mixing in with Jeffrey pines and Coulter pines. And of course also oak woodland as well. So sometimes you can see them up in the forest. Once you get up in elevation, they tend to be almost strictly. I can't say 100% because it seems like nothing's really 100% in nature. They tend to be more of a south-facing slope plant. As you can see here, I'm on a slightly southern exposure. Actually kind of on a flat to slightly southern exposure. And that's why I'm seeing more of them here. But they do grow on the north facing slope sometimes. But you're more likely to see that at the lower elevations of its, of its uh, elevational range. So chaparral yucca, Hesperal yucca whippley. So, I told you that they produce these beautiful flowers, and then they produce these seed capsules. So how do we get from flowers to seed capsules? Well, pollination. How does a chaparral yucca get pollinated? It requires a very small range of very specific types of moths to carry out pollination of the flowers. And those moths are in the genus Tegeticula. I believe it's Tegeticula maculata, I believe is the name of the moth. It's basically the chaparral yucca moth or the yucca moth. Yuccas and chaparral yuccas rely on those specific type of moths for them to be able to produce seed. So if the moths are absent in an area, the plants are not going to produce seed. They're not going to produce seed. So what happens is the moths basically hang out in the flowers and go from flower to flower. They'll, a lot of times they'll lay their eggs in the flowers and in the, the larval stage the plant, the, they'll eat part of the seed capsule and some of the seeds, not all the seeds, just enough to get by and survive. And then they leave enough seeds for a future generation. So what happens is after a larva, the larva will fall out of the seed capsule, and then I guess what they do is they, I believe they bury in the soil, sometimes for years, I believe. I would do a little more research on that. And then, then they'll become adults, and then once the yuccas are flowering, the adults will fly up into the yucca flowers and pollinate them. So, living in, uh, living in suburban North Orange County, California, well away from nat uh, natural yucca populations, we do have species of yucca that are planted. Most likely yucca, elephantipes, the Guatemalan yucca, and yucca gloriosa, the sandhill yucca. And I see them flower every summer, but I n was always wondering why they never produce seed capsules or seeds. Well, it's because they also rely on their own type of moths to pollinate them, which are absent from North Orange County, California. So that's why a lot of yuccas planted in residential areas that are not close to the foothills of the mountains where native yucca populations are will not get pollinated. So I figured, figured it was time to finally spotlight that plant. I've been fascinated with chaparral yucca. 
Well, the other thing to note is sometimes fire is a very good way to get them to bloom, from what I've read. Some places after fire will send up tons and tons and tons of chaparral yucca flowers. So, with that in mind, these hardy plants can be quite resistant to fire. Their rosettes will burn, but the tissue, the tissue inside will still be alive, and the new leaves will sprout out. So yuccas, these yuccas are very drought resistant because they can grow in quite literally very close to desert conditions, if not into desert conditions, A, and B, their root system is very tough and the rosettes are very tough. So while the, burnt, the leaves on the outside will burn, there will still be enough living tissue for the plant to send up more shoots. So, does that mean that you have to fire scarify them to germinate them? Not necessarily. Hespero yucca whippley probably germinates more in fire and in disturbance, which is true. Sometimes you'll go in a fire scarred area and you'll see a ton of yucca seedlings. However, it's not 100% necessary. I'm not sure exactly what the viability percentage is, but I've had chaparral yucca seeds germinate for me before. Simply planting them in the dirt and keeping them moist. So I have a couple chaparral yucca seedlings at home. A couple of which are doing very well. They seem to be a very tolerant species of plant. And definitely, definitely worth another look. They might be the bane of hikers in the sense that you get burnt, or you get, you get pricked really hard, you get poked, and a lot of hikers hate hiking through them, but they are quite a beautiful plant and they're very extraordinary when it comes to bloom. So there you have it, Hespero yucca whippley, chaparral yucca. I hope that any of you who watch who disdain this plant, just take a chance to, just take a chance to have some kind of appreciation for it. It is a beautiful shrub, shrub-like plant, beautiful shrubby plant, beautiful flowers. I wish I knew more about birds. But uh, chaparral yuck is definitely worth another look. Yes, it pokes, it hurts. Boy, does it hurt, especially if you have to bushwhack through it. But it's there to protect the plant. It's its protection against being chewed alive and stuff. So, there you have it. Hespero yucca whippley. Chaparral yucca. This is Brian, Spotlight Video. Thanks for watching. I hope you found it interesting, and I hope it gave you a new found appreciation for this beautiful plant. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on my next Spotlight.